Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yangji, for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come and speak to all of you. Uh, this is really, a, I think, a great opportunity uh, to convey some of what we do uh, in our lab, in our field, to what you're doing here. I must say, I'm a bit of an outsider. As you heard from Yangji, I'm not classically trained as a computer vision scientist. I'm a neuroscientist. And most of the views that I'll tell you, though, about neuroscience aren't necessarily reflective of all of neuroscience. But I hope to be an ambassador between our two fields. And I hope you'll see that in my talk. Now, most of what's motivated me, and maybe many of you, in my career has been to try to understand this computing device. It's just uh, three pounds and only 20 watts, yet it underlies all of who we are and how we see and understand the world. Uh, I think many of you are motivated by questions of how do we build silicon-based, let's call it computer vision or computational vision, and maybe motivated by how it might build it to exceed or at least match a biological human vision. And just as a bit of preamble, I'd like to kind of talk about ways that you might think about brain and cognitive sciences as you go about your work. So some possible strategies if this is your goal. You might say, let's ignore brain and cognitive sciences completely. Uh, I don't think that's true of most of you because you're at least attending my talk, so you're paying a little bit of attention. You could say, let's ignore brain and cognitive sciences at the engineering level, just build whatever you want, and talk about your systems as being, quote, brain-inspired. Um, you know, that's uh, really good for PR and advertising. I've seen people do that. It's not my favorite way to see our field portrayed. Um, a little better is to use human performance as a benchmark to report your progress to the world. This is also good for PR and is a little better because you are at least um, uh, measuring against a biological marker, that is, the human performance level. You could study simple reduced biological vision systems and hope that you could discover some principles that are somehow scalable to the human system. Uh, this is the uh, kind of implicit approach of most neuroscientists, uh, and it's not a bad approach either. I want to kind of today talk about maybe the last approach or the fifth approach on my list, which is really to forward engineer within wisely chosen brain and cognitive sciences constraints, but confirm your correspondence with uh, those constraints as you go. So an interplay between model building and data measurements. And we call this in our field reverse engineering. This is what we do around vision that I'll tell you about next. But I think you can apply this philosophy uh, to lots of problems in intelligence. And this is what's happening across MIT and other universities. And I think that's a good model for how to go forward. And I hope I can portray some of that in the area of computer vision. A bonus of this approach, if you're able to succeed or make progress, is not only might you succeed on your original problem of understanding how to build a computer vision system, but that models that you create might enable advances in human health and things like brain-machine interfaces, being able to inject signals to restore sight or to augment vision. Uh, those are things that where you need to be connected to the biology to do. Those are goals of neuroscience, and they could uh, become supported by your work if you follow this, this kind of approach, what I'm calling reverse engineering. So let me start by introducing our problem, which is that humans have what we call strong scene perception. And I really mean that in just a catch-all way to say that when you look at a scene like this one, you could identify the objects, uh, cars and buildings and signs and so forth, but also th other latent content like the pose and position of the cars and the people, uh, safe navigable paths, where you might walk in this scene, all the things you might want to do to, say, support things like self-driving cars. Um, humans seem to do this kind of stuff effortlessly. We don't work on that entire problem yet. We're working on what we consider a building block of that, uh, that, we, that I'll call object perception. And our goal is to reverse engineer object perception. And we operationalize that much as you do by saying, can we identify, categorize, and identify things in the scene, like cars, people, buildings, and also other latent content, such as the position, size, pose, et cetera. And I'm going to lump that all together into what I call our operational definition of object perception. And our goal is to understand how the brain accomplishes this. Constraints from our field tell us that you, when you look at that scene, your visual system doesn't digest it all at once. You may be having high acuity in the center of gaze. The ventral visual stream in your brain that I'll talk about in a minute really 
it focuses on the central 10 degrees, which I've illustrated here for you. And the way that you absorb the whole scene is by making rapid eye movements to explore the scene. So you may fixate for a few hundred milliseconds at that location, and you make psychotic movements at about this rate, where you're sampling the scene for a few hundred milliseconds at each of these fixations. And that's when you do your seeing of the world, not while your eyes are moving. Um, and then what this does is it brings to your, to your brain, to your eye, and the rest of your brain is something that looks like a series of snapshots that I'm showing you here. I hope that you notice that you could maybe recognize one or more objects in each and every one of those frames. Um, this is what um, we refer to as core object perception, your ability to perform recognition uh, abilities in the central 10 degrees of your visual field with just a couple hundred milliseconds of viewing duration. I hope I illustrated for you that your abilities are quite good at this. Um, we didn't discover this. This has been known for many decades. In fact, um, some of the pioneering work in, by Molly Potter and others doing designs like this rapid serial visual presentation show that you're quite good at this. So these are now completely out of context, yet you can recognize one or more objects in each and every scene. You probably just saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and even though I didn't cue you for it, buildings in Italy. So th that is a reflection of how quickly your visual system can digest these things and connect them to memory. So let's come back to how do we work on that problem, that problem that we consider to be foundational to larger scene understanding, again, that we call core object perception. So now we're, our approach is to try to define and operationalize and a domain of interest. I've already done that a bit for you, especially focus on where current engineering systems fall short then get measurements from the system components that are critical to performance, and by that I mean the biological components. And here you must choose wisely. There's many things you could measure in the brain. It's a complicated place. You could measure behavior. You could measure spikes. You could measure anatomy, blood flow. Neural, you could do neural perturbations. You could look subcellularly, mess with genetics. So you must choose wisely as to, to, uh, to constrain your problem of interest. Then you can do forward engineering under these constraints, and this is perhaps the most critical step um, to be able to organize those data into a, a model. This is, again, referred to as model building, and you must be able to not only explain the data that you capture, but predict new data. And it's this interplay between measurements and model building that, again, I'm referring to as reverse engineering. And then if you succeed in that, you can even grow your domain beyond the domain that I've defined you, for instance, in our problem, to say expand beyond core perception to other problems as well. But this is the approach that we try to take. And I hope that today I can summarize for you, you'll see this approach as our progress on building what I'm calling end-to-end -end models of primate core object perception with this reverse engineering approach. So let's talk about operationalizing where systems currently fall short. Object recognition is an interesting problem because there's thousands of objects. That's not what makes it challenging, as many of you already know. Your field knows quite well the reason this problem is challenging is that uh, the same object will never present uh, the same image to your eyes twice, so that this, uh, this is due to things like variation in position size, pose illumination, um, subordinate level variation, clutter, background clutter, and even occluding clutter. All of this to, uh, makes this problem quite challenging, as you know. The way we approach this problem is to actually generate images like this one. These are much of the test images that we've been using in humans and monkeys. They may look a little strange to you. We call them naturalistic. These are rendered objects placed on uncorrelated backgrounds. Um, the reason we do this is because we found in 2009 that this would easily foil computer vision systems at the time that were claiming to do object recognition, yet humans could do this quite well. So we thought this isolated the problems of interest. And so a lot of the data I'll show you comes from these kind of images, uh, but I'll show you some other data at the end from uh, more photographic images. OK, to convince you that you can do this, here's how we actually test humans. You can try it yourself. So images are presented again, focusing on the central here, eight degrees. An image might come up like this. And your job is to report what you saw. I hope most of you could see that there was a face or a head in that image. And you'd pick the left choice when I give you these two choices. Um, here's another try for you. So that was a bird. And one more, I'll do the face again so you can get a feel for it. We run these kind of trials on humans, and as you'll see monkeys, we run them um, interleaved, so you don't know what objects are coming, yet you can do this quite well, just like I didn't pre-cue you as to what you might be seeing here. Um, to show you that you do this quite well, this is data from humans, not exactly in this task, but in a closely related task. On the y-axis is performance in units of D prime, to high D prime means good performance if you're not used to D prime. Uh, four, a D prime of four is a, about a 98% accuracy. 
And what I want you to see here is that humans are very, very good. They're shown in red. And on the x-axis shows uh, our very, a knob that we call uncertainty as we go from sort of frontal centered objects to high variation in objects on the right, where uh, an object can appear, as I was showing you, in many different poses and positions. Um, and and that uh, creates more challenges for humans, yet they hold up quite well in those conditions. Yet computer vision systems, at least at the time that we were beginning this work around 2009, um, they fall off pretty poorly in those conditions. So we focused on this effort, these area, this area that we call view and rec view invariant recognition behavior, core recognition behavior. Again, we want a system that performs. I've been talking about humans. You all have a sense that you perform just by sitting there watching my slides. We use this system to study it, the rhesus monkey system. Um, part of the reason we use the rhesus monkey is shown here. Monkeys can readily do this task um, almost as well as you can. They're easily trained to do this task. This is a monkey in its home cage um, pressing a button to initiate a trial. You'll notice an image comes up, and it's choosing left or right what object it thinks it saw. Um, the green is light indicates correct trials. You see he's getting most of them correct. And I'll show you the data in a minute. They love to do this all day long in their home cage. It's like video games for them, and they get a small um, juice reward that you see through that tube there. OK, so what's really interesting is when you test monkeys in this way and you compare with humans, these are the data that you get. Um, on average, the monkey performance is slightly lower than the humans. Um, but notice that the patterns of confusion shown in these matrices are almost identical. Um, we've quantified that for in these papers that I list below. But all I want you to see is that the patterns of reds and blues match up. And those show the confusion, the difficulties of uh, distinguishing objects from one another in D prime units. And don't worry about the details of the data. I just want you to know that they're about the same. Um, this is intuitive when I show you more closely. Camels are often confused with dogs. Those are 3D similar shapes. Uh, tanks are often confused with trucks. That's what's being reflected in this data. Although these matrices don't pop out if you run them on pixels or other simple visual representations, and they, didn't be, they were not produced by computer vision systems at the time. So these were kind of unique matrices where humans and monkeys were identical um, when we measured this. Now, this is averaging over many images in each category, and I'm going to come back to that later. But for now, it means that we have a system that models the system of interest, that is, the non-human primate is almost identical to the human. And um, most importantly, the reason we're working on a non-human primate is that we can go in and measure information processing at the level at which vision occurs, at the level of neuronal spikes that I'll show you in a minute. And we have more advanced tools now that allow us to manipulate those neurons to test ideas about how the circuits are computing. Those are things that are not easily doable in humans and sometimes not doable at all in humans. So we have a system that performs, yet we can engage with it. The, the human brain is shown on the left, the monkey brain on the right. Both brains have a series of areas called the ventral visual stream that supports this task. The reason we know this is that areas uh, like IT cortex at the top of the ventral stream that I'll talk a lot about, lesions in these areas produce strong deficits in recognition tasks. This has been known for decades. Um, and what we also can do as engineers is take these areas and lay them out in this way. So I should highlight for you, just to orient you, that information comes in, of course, at the eyes, which you see on the human brain. It projects into the middle of the brain and in the thalamus, a place labeled LGN on this slide, and then projects to the first cortical area in the back of the brain, visual area V1, followed by a series of additional cortical areas in a, a deep stack network, network, V2, V4, and IT. And there are millions of neurons in each area. There are feed-forward connections and feedback connections as well. So this is a rough a lay of the land of the ventral visual stream that's critical for the task that I've been showing you. Each area is defined in part because there's a complete retinotopic map of the visual field. In IT cortex at the top of the stream, there are thought to be about three maps, and it's much less retinotopic. But I'll consider it, talk about it today as if it's one area. Uh, this uh, ventral stream is dominated by the central 10 degrees of visual field, as I said earlier, uh, especially at the upper reaches. And what happens when an image is presented to this system, the retina makes a nice copy, if you will, an isomorphic pattern. The retinal ganglion cells at the back of the eye are firing in a one-to-one -one pixel-wise manner with the image. It produces a, a, a new population pattern of activity in the LGN, a new pattern in V1, V2, V4, and IT. So you end up in IT with about 10% of neurons firing in response to any natural image. Um, but it's not a photographic copy anymore. The brain has transformed the data from some population space to another population space. 
Um, this occurs with a lag of about 100 milliseconds. New image produces a new pattern in IT. And when you're watching this rapid serial visual presentation movie that I showed you earlier, your homolog of IT is clicking along at a lag of about 100 milliseconds, easily following with a unique pattern for each and every one of these images. Um, what these patterns, the, the reason we know something about what I'm showing you here is that people have recorded and studied these neurons before. I want to give you a feel for the elemental data that drives this conceptual model. Neurons communicate with each other, which are with, or what, which are with what are called spikes. That's how a neuron talks to another neuron. Spikes, when you record with extracellular microelectrodes lowered into the brain, are plotted here as individual tick marks from one single site recording an IT. I, this is a response to just four images repeated multiple times, which are shown as the rows. What I want you to notice here is that you see for the first two images, more tick marks. That is a, what's called a higher response. And for the last two images, less spikes, a lower response. Um, this is just one IT neural site. I want you to also notice the time scale here. The image is presented for just 100 milliseconds, which is the bar shown at the bottom, which is these core recognition conditions. Um, and um, you can see, again, a latency of about 100 milliseconds or so in this IT neuron. Here's a different IT neural site that likes, it prefers different images. You see that it responds especially best to the second image. Um, this neural site responds best to the third and fourth. So the IT neurons appear somewhat unique when you sample them. OK, we can quantify all this, and we do. Um, the way we do this is by counting spikes in time windows such as these ones. Um, many neuroscientists are interested in the actual detailed variability of these spikes. We don't think this much matters for our questions of interest. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about that with you here today. But just keep in mind that we can take the response of each neuron to each image as a number. So for instance, here you're getting one single number by averaging over a time window, which is a window of interest to us that we vary, but I won't talk much about that today. Just think about a 100 millisecond counting window where you get one number out of the neuron. So here you're getting four images, you get four numbers. We, of course, don't collect just four images out of an example neuron, but we collect many images. Shown here is in another example IT neuron in response to 1,600 test images. So um, these bla this black line is not time. Those are the response to images. Um, again, the mean response is shown on the y-axis in spikes per second. And what I want you to see is that um, this is a complicated pattern of response. I'm showing you four of those images of the type I showed you earlier with rendered objects on complex backgrounds. Um, notice that you might tend to call this neuron a chair neuron. I've grouped the images by category here. But that would be incorrect because the neuron responds better to some planes and some boats than to some images of chairs. Um, although there is a sort of weak categorical structure, the response is much more complicated than that. And um, people have spent careers or decades really trying to understand what these neurons care about in the image. It's been a very challenging problem in our field. Uh, here's another example. I, it's another way to put this is that IT neurons are like enigmatic, that is, not understood snowflakes. They appear individually unique. Um, here's another example uh, from a neuron that you might call a face neuron. Um, this neuron responds more to images of faces than to other things on average. But in detail, it likes some images of faces better than other images of faces. So it's incorrect to strictly think of it as a categorical neuron. It has some complicated properties that we don't yet understand or that we didn't understand when we started this work. So the first thing that we aim to do in my lab now with that background is to ask, how can these neuronal populations explain behavior? People thought IT has something to do with behavior, but can it easily explain behavior? You might think this is a hopeless quest, that you're going to have an area where there's about 10 million output neurons, and think about how you could possibly read the code out of the neurons to s explain how the animal is doing its behavior. Um, but we went ahead anyway and tried some obvious things that we thought might be good to try. And I'll give you a sense of these things, in fact, because they work quite well. The basic idea is to think of um, IT as a feature space where each time you present an image such as this one, you get a pattern of evoked activity such as that shown here. You have N neurons. You have spikes coming out of N neurons. You can count spikes of each neuron, as I showed you earlier. So you get one number from each neuron. Um, so you have N neurons. You have N numbers. You can think of it as, as a population feature vector. You can think of it as a point in an N-dimensional space. So that's just for one image that happens to contain a face. 
Here schematically shown might be the uh, imagined the um, responses of a population of IT neurons to uh, different images that also contain faces. And in red would be perhaps images of neurons that don't contain faces. This is just conceptual. Um, but the idea was, could you decode easily with simple readout tools, like simple linear classifiers, to say that a face has been presented versus a face has not been presented? And of course, you know these tools well, so I won't take you through that in detail. But we apply these simple linear classifiers to population patterns of IT for every object task um, that, that we ask an animal to do and ask how well it can predict the animal's behavior. Um, and what I want to do for my neuroscience colleagues, if they're already in the room, is that this is not really that, uh, really that uh, crazy of an idea, because if you think about whatever the downstream neurons are that are looking at IT, the classic models of neurons are weighted sums followed by thresholds, which is essentially what a classifier is doing. In any case, when we apply these uh, simple linear classifiers to IT population data, we get very good predictions of the behavioral performance. And I'll show you that in a minute. Part of the reason that we're able to do this is that we had to really scale up to collect a large number of amount of data to test those population vectors. To do that, we developed methods to implant chronic recording arrays in animals. These are 100 channel arrays. We typically put three of them in at once. They're implanted in a sterile surgery. And then the animal can be connected to recording each day while it performs visual tasks, while we record large amounts of data. These methods allowed us in around 2010 to dramatically scale up the amount of data we collect in terms of number of images um, tested per day, per site. Um, and so we've leveraged that to build large population spaces uh, data from IT and other places. Here's typically what we get now on the order of 100 to 1,000 neurons in response to an image like this one. Again, I'm showing you one feature vector in response to one image. Um, here's eight images. And you can see the green now indicates high response, the black low response. Uh, and I hope you get the idea of this is just a simple feature vector like I showed a minute ago. And we don't collect just eight images, but we collect thousands of images on the order of 2,000 images or so in a typical data set. We can collect many more than that, but part of the reason in the sets I'll show you we only have 2,000 is we use a lot of our presentations to repeat conditions on the order of 50 times or so to get very high SNR in our measurements of these neurons. Um, so these are the kind of data sets that we've worked with over the last few years. And the summary of the story I've already alluded to, which is that if you take these population patterns and you look at those behavioral patterns that I showed you earlier and you apply simple linear decoders to IT, that you automatically get those kind of behavioral patterns. And we show this as almost quantitatively perfect at this grain um, when you do this. Um, so this suggests that IT cortex almost directly can support the animal's behavioral judgments of what kind of object it sees out there in the world. And I should say that controls show that if you apply this to, say, retinal-like data or early visual cortex data, you don't get these exact same patterns. It's not as if linear decoders applied to any representation produce this. OK, a key thing that I'd like you to know is you don't need many IT features to get this human level performance that you see in, in a monkey. On the order of about 500 IT features was our estimate. This is a bit of an older slide, and we've confirmed this with newer data. And I want to contrast that to computer vision models at the time, which um, had much lower performance per feature at the time. So this was a clue to us that, hey, a relatively low dimensional feature set is probably what's supporting the animal's ability. And that's probably what you want your computational model to look like. You know, now, this is a reminder, IT contains about 10 million output neurons. We think it conveys on the order of less than 1,000 features. And this is supported by other work by Sidney Lecky estimating the dimensionality of IT. What about other properties of, neuro, of, of what you can get out of IT? Uh, I told you about category and identity. What about things like uh, position or perimeter, uh, size or bounding area, rotation? Those are other latent variables that you might want to estimate. Well, we went ahead and because we had measured these and uh, we knew all these properties from these images we created, we estimated human ability to judge these variables. And when we do that and we make those measurements of behavioral performance patterns and we apply linear decoders again to IT, now using regression instead of a classification, again, only about 500 features predicts the behavioral patterns, again, almost exactly. And this is quite remarkable. The same number of features comes out with a completely different approach. So, um, and this, this really, to us, supports the idea that IT is a general basis to support a whole range of object perception tasks. 
Now, the specific parameters of how we do the decoding and the regression are, of course, important to neuroscience-related applications, but I won't talk about them here for you today. I want to also highlight that the work here allowing to showing that IT can support this is really done by a number of investigators, some postdocs, graduate students, and even an undergrad shown here over a number of years, all the work I'm summarizing for you in this slide. But what I want you to take from this so far, and this is just a big picture message, is that the IT feature set is biology's underlying solution to efficiently support maybe most, maybe all of core object perception challenges with simple linear classification. I want to caveat that by saying I'm talking about the central 10 degrees, 200 milliseconds duration, rigid objects, and only a certain, certain set of latent variables that we asked to be estimated. So we haven't tested everything possible, but this domain is already quite large and still fits the behavioral data quite well. So we have a linkage between IT and behavior that's now well established. Okay, this is, as I've already said, you should think of IT as a relatively fixed basis set with little back-end training to support many object-related tasks. Okay, this is just setting up, though, a deeper problem, which is I told you these IT neurons were complicated, and now I'm telling you when you take a bunch of complicated neurons and a smaller set of them can support the behavioral tasks, um, where do the IT neurons come from themselves? How are they computed from the image on the, on the retina? And how do those computations here on the ventral stream get set up after birth? Okay, so when we were doing this work, of course, this was one of our other goals, not just to measure IT, but to try to build models that go from the image to each intermediate level, ultimately predicting IT. And I want to say that we focused especially on feed-forward models. And at the time when we were doing this work, people had already explained lower level areas like V1 with reasonable models. You've probably seen Gabor-like models to explain V1. The field debates how much, but explaining about half the explainable response variance in V1, whereas other image computable models were explaining very little variance in IT on the order of 20% or less. With a, with a gradual fall off across the ventral stream. So we really had pretty poor models to go along the ventral stream at the time. Now, all the models I'm going to talk about to you next, they basically, they don't do the whole task that the animal does. They just take an image such as this one and the central eight degrees, and they try to make a feature space out of it and then a linear classification step at the end. All of these models are basically built off of constraints from brain science. So as I said, forward engineering at the beginning of my talk, within constraints, these are constraints from neuroscience, and I won't read them all to you because you probably know them all already. They're the constraints that led to the family of deep convolutional networks. Um, these are the, it's said here in words, um, filters, convolution, threshold nonlinearities, normalization. Um, people have known for decades that these are the kind of things that the brain's deep network uses to process its, data, process its inputs. And models to do recognition were started way back in 1980 by Fukushima. Um, this was later followed. You can see this has a kind of, kind of layout sort of like uh, the ventral stream. Um, it was made more like the ventral stream in models of the HMAX class by Tommy Poggio, Thomas Sayre, uh, Max Reisenhuber in, this, in the 1999 to 2007 or so. Um, Dave Cox and Nicholas Pinto um, built another class of models um, following off of this class that made progress, especially on problems in face processing. Uh, and then I want to tell you about this model called HMO that, that we made in our lab by a postdoc, Dan Yamans, who's now assistant professor at Stanford, and a graduate student, Ha Hung. And I want to tell you about HMO, not that it's a specially performing model that you should know about, but that, that it taught us some important lessons about how models can explain what's going on in the brain, and I hope to share those with you. Okay, so what is HMO? HMO is a deep neural network. We built it to have four layers, roughly corresponding to the four layers that I've been talking about in the cortex. Um, we um, included those steps that I had talked about earlier, make it convolutional, many filter types, things that I think folks in this room know well. So what we think of this is that neuroscience was constraining what I call the macro and the meso architecture. Internally, it had, again, linear filters followed by static nonlinearities and a normalization or pooling step. Again, things that I think this audience knows well that are now standard fare in deep neural networks. These were things that we thought we had to include because this is what neuroscience was telling us. Um, then what Dan and Ha did was to try to get these models and optimize them to do the kind of things that many of you like to do, is get them to do something interesting. So we optimized them to do view invariant recognition tasks over a large number of objects. 
um, and um, th this was done um, using a bunch of applied math and computer science tricks. Um, and I don't think those are biological, but, and I want to say for the aficionados, what we were doing was mostly architectural detail optimization, um, not so much weight optimization, although we now do more weight optimization. Um, yet we were still able to, through these kind of architectural optimizations, and that was using things like HyperOp, developed by James Bergstra and Dave Cox, using those kind of optimizations to find models in this space that were actually quite good at performing at relative to control models at the time that I'm showing you here at the bottom. So we, got, we at least got our HMO model up to the level of IT and human performance. We had achieved a decent optimization. I want to say there was no neural fitting in these models. Um, no, unlike current other neuroscientists that are trying to fit neural data directly, we were just doing engineering within a space of neuroscience and optimizing like many of you might do. Okay, then the last thing we did that was quite interesting is we took these neurons in these models and we asked, compared them to the neurons that we had recorded in IT cortex and its input area V4 using similar recording methods to those I showed earlier. The way we compared them was to use the neurons within the model uh, as, a, as a basis set. So we used the IT basis in the model as, uh, to, to try to fit individual IT neurons in the actual IT of the brain and similar for V4. And we then tested the goodness of prediction using held out data. And I'll show you some of those predictions now. Here's this IT neuronal population patterns. If I take one example neuron out, I showed you this neuron earlier, has a very complicated response that was hard to explain. Um, the response, old models predicted only 20% of the variance. Um, now we have this new model, HMO, take, you do a regression, and these are the predictions on held out data, and you can see how tight this fit is. Um, as I'll highlight here for you, it fits I mean, a lot of the detail of the response to individual images here in this IT neuron that, again, were previously very mysterious. Doesn't fit everything. It explains about half the explainable response variance, but that was a really big jump over previous models. So this was quite exciting for us that now some of these enigmatic snowflakes started to be understandable in the context of these models. Here's this face neuron I showed you earlier. It also is, again, quite well predicted by the HMO basis at level of IT. So you can see that as well. Here's a V4 neuron. This is the input to IT. Its responses may look even more complicated to you because it has very, even almost no categorical structure. Um, yet we found that uh, the models, especially the second to last hidden layer, layer three, or what we called our V4 layer, was able actually to predict it again quite well, as you see the red line overlying the black line here from layer three. Um, this again brought us from old models explaining 30% to new models explaining about half the explainable response variance. These are predictions um, from mid-level neurons that did not see any of these objects uh, during creation. So this model was just optimized on some objects and then tested on completely new stuff to explain IT. No neural data were used, as I said, to generate the model neurons. And the model is not a black box. This is really for my neuroscience colleagues that this is a model. We built it. And we can map its internals to the brain. So it helps us in our neuroscience goals. The meta lesson we took from this beyond having better models of explaining IT is shown here, and maybe this is the most important lesson for this group, is that um, performance of deep CNNs is shown on the x-axis, and the ability of a model to fit IT in the way I just showed you is on the y-axis. So what you're seeing here in the blue dots are samples of models from a deep CNN family. They're not optimized in any particular way. And in black, you're seeing other models in the field at the time that we did this work. And what I want you to notice is there's a correlation between the x and the y axis. And what we think we did was doing something like you might think of evolution or development. We optimized along this axis to perform on a recognition task. We got a model we called HMO, and it increased the amount of variance we could explain within the higher levels of the ventral visual stream, especially IT cortex. OK, this was, again, exciting to us. And what this means for all of you is that we were kind of doing a computer vision goal, and that was enabling a neuroscience goal, as you see here. And so um, we thought, well, OK, now here we are as brain and cognitive scientists trying to build these models. And I described a line of models already to you and, and their roots. And our goal was to understand how the brain works. But your field, in particular, has been doing things around engineering high-performance algorithms. 
And um, your field, as you know, has especially had a line of work recently that has been come to the fore, which began really a long time ago with neural network models that have now become very exciting again. Especially to us, we noticed the work of Jan LeCun, Jeff Hinton, um, Zyler and Fergus, and others that you know. Um, this work was really represents a convergence, I think, between these two fields in their model building. And this is good news because now we may be working on the same problem. So you all know about the breakthroughs in and deep learning that were spurred by, spurred by AlexNet winning the ImageNet challenge in 2012. In 2013, we decided to compare AlexNet features and Zyler and Fergus features to what we were seeing in IT Cortex. And this was done by Charles Cadoa, a postdoc. And I just want you to see in this slide how well that the IT features and the AlexNet and Zyler and Fergus features line up in terms of their ability to support categorization performance much better than control models. The most interesting thing to us, though, was that these models were able to predict the IT neurons even better than our HMO models. So they were higher performing, and they predicted the neurons better, which is shown here in this plot. So this suggests that, at least within this time window, models are being developed that are higher performing in the deep net family, and they're explaining the internals of the brain better and better, at least up to this point. So that's quite exciting meta lesson. I want to say also that there's also been great work. I'm showing you neural work. There's been work on human fMRI by a number of labs. Um, Kriegis Gorte, Ode Olivia at MIT, Jack Gallant and Jatandra Malik at Berkeley, and Justin Gardner, who have been using these same kind of deep nets to explain what's measured at human fMRI at a coarser resolution, but also showing the same idea that these models are able to better fit the variance of the responses at higher levels of the visual system. So I really would like to say this really is a heartfelt thank you to all of you because even models, even if you didn't know it, people in your field were building models that are helping us to understand the brain. We are working toward the same goal, I'd say, at the moment, but will this relationship last? That's the question that we're trying to keep our eyes on at the moment. So if you think about where these models are going, you know your field quite well. Much of your work has now gravitated toward using these deep nets as a foundation for much of what you do. Um, more advanced models are, of course, coming out that you know even better than I do. But our questions are, do these models start to explain the brain even better than the models that we had in the past? And so it's good to sit back and let you continue to build models, and we can maybe test to see if they're working or not. We'll build models all on our own. I want to show you kind of, though, the question of, can we just sit back and wait for you to hand us even better models? And I'm not so sure that that's going to work. And the reason of that is shown here. This is a recent slide from our lab, relatively new. Um, again, what you're seeing is a computer vision goal of ImageNet validation performance on the x-axis, and our goal, fitting neurons on the y-axis. And there's some models developed in our lab shown as the orange dots. You see the continuation of that trend that I showed you earlier. Higher performing models tend to fit IT better, at least within an architectural space that we're using. Um, but now here are some models from your field, AlexNet, ResNet, VGG, Exception. They are, of course, higher performing. You guys are better at computer vision engineering than we are, so that's good. Um, but the models are not yet not doing any better in explaining data than, say, AlexNet did even a few years ago. So um, things may not be moving in the same direction, and our job is to find models within this space that stay close to what we're seeing in the biology. So a summary of what I've told you is that our fields have together achieved the first decent predictive models of each of these neural processing stages. Um, and um, what's left? So should I retire? We have decent models, about half the explainable variance. What to do next? Well, let's just talk about the behavior a little bit. So um, remember, uh, let's just, I told you about the behavior before, so ignore the internals of the brain and just let's look at how things are explaining the behavior. I showed you early on that humans and monkeys had this interesting common pattern of confusion um, that they shared, and that's why we use the monkey model. But now we can put up a deep CNN, and you can see it actually has a very similar pattern of confusion. If anything, it reveals itself as being slightly better when you see the blue spots in the corner that's showing it's doing a little bit better um, than these other systems. This is Inception V3, but we could pick any of those deep CNNs, and they're going to look very similar. This means at this level of resolution, these behavioral tests do not allow us to falsify or distinguish among these deep CNNs which ones may be more or less brain-like. So what we did as good experimentalists is say, let's turn up the heat 
on the models. Let's get more data. So this team in my lab set about to collect more data, both human data from Amazon Maternal Turk and monkey home cage testing, as I showed you earlier. Lots of behavioral data. And when we do that, we can now zoom in at higher resolution to say, now, rather than averaging over images, we can say, say for these images of a wrench, probability that each image of a wrench is incorrectly, is correctly called a wrench is shown in the upper left here. Or we can look at the probability that each image of a hammer is incorrectly called a wrench. And you can see that there's strong variation within the images, probably not surprising to all of you. And now we can measure this reliably at the behavioral level because we have many, many, many trials, millions of trials built into these kinds of data. And you see, you, I'm showing you data here from a biological system, a primate system. But we can, of course, take any model feature set and generate these exact same tests of a model, now looking at much finer resolution and ask how well these two things correlate with each other. I will now first show you that monkeys correlate still very well with humans, even at this finer grain of resolution. So that's good. The primate system is still matching the other primate system. Um, that's what you see in the red versus the blue bar. But now here's a bunch of artificial feature sets that before we couldn't rule out. Now they're all sitting clearly below the models. So there's clearly a gap between all of these feature sets that you see here and the behavior that we see in primates. There's something left to explain. Perhaps these models are, models are missing some key architectural component. Um, we are especially intrigued by this idea of the models missing something. And I'll try to take you through that next. So far, we've only modeled the feed-forward aspect of the brain. But we know, as I mentioned earlier, there's feedback and intracortical connections that we've left off of models that may be supporting some of the uh, additional behavior that um, this primate has that the models currently don't have. And I want to show you some of the evidence we have for that. And this comes from um, teaming up with our Murray team, uh, including folks like Jatandra Malik and Fei Fei Lee, which encouraged us to use MS Coco images to test our monkeys and our neurons, not just our synthetic images. So we've started testing those. And I hope that that builds even better connections with your community. And what we've been doing, I'll show you here one of the exciting things that we've found so far is now using these high throughput testing. And when I say we, I mean two postdocs, Kohitic Carr and Jonas Kubilis. Um, what we did is to use the high throughput testing to compare computer vision systems. And it really doesn't matter which of those systems. This plot would look very similar with monkey performance. Each dot is an image. And we can find many images where the CV systems are falling short of the primate systems in terms of their performance. These are what we refer to as CV unsolved images, shown here in red. And we have a bunch of CV solved images that we're showing here in blue. And we can then look in the brain to ask, what's different between these images that might give us some clues of how to improve the models? I know many of you are interested in adversarial images generated from models. Um, we consider these to be like discovered adversarial images, where we're just taking a brute force approach of testing lots of things, and then using the primate system uh, as a screen to say, when are things much better than they are with computer vision systems? Here's some examples of those images, just to show you. Um, there's nothing I want you to see here. We've tried to regress out factors from the images that might explain what makes it unsolved versus solved. Nothing obvious jumps out of us when we do those kinds of analyses. But I want to show you something that has jumped out of us and leave you with this bit of information. So if we look at now, we sort of focus on images that m humans and monkeys do very well, shown in this orange bar. And we then compare when computer vision systems do well, shown in blue, versus when computer vision systems do poorly, shown in red. And we now look at what happens in the brain comparing those two types of images. We can record neural activity at the top level of the brain in IT cortex. Remember, I told you IT seems to contain the brain's solution, at least to the images we had shown before, its solution to its good behavior. So then we can go and record IT with, again, triple array implants and non-human primates, present an image, collect the neural data. We get an IT population vector out. And then we can build our linear classifiers, as we did before, to ask how well, how well these population vectors can, again, explain the behavior on both CV solved and CV unsolved images. So I'll show you one of the most interesting things that we've found so far is that if we look now as a function of time, as when we show an image such as this image of a face, and we look at the, the, what's coming out of IT cortex now at high temporal resolution, we see that the performance comes up to decoding the animal level performance at about 100 milliseconds. So you reach monkey accuracy and just over the latency of IT neurons for this example image. Here's another example image, again, a CV solved image, again, about 100 millisecond latency. 
But if we look at some of these CV unsolved images, like this image of a car, we see that the decoding takes longer to occur. Notice the IT neurons are responding. See all the green at the top. Um, uh, yet, they haven't yet come up with a solution in their population yet. The decoding accuracy doesn't reach monkey level accuracy until uh, about 100 milliseconds later. Similarly, here's another example image of a foreshortened dog, and you see the same thing that it takes a while to get up there. Now, these are just four examples. Here's some more examples. These are 16 examples, but we've collected thousands of images this way. Um, and we've measured them at high resolution. But the, the one qualitative message I want to give you, and you can see that already in the examples and the blue and red dots at the bottom, is that the average time of the CV solved images is about 30 milliseconds less than the CV unsolved. So the brain takes an additional 30 milliseconds to do something. Um, we think this is, has, has something to do, as I already alluded to, with feedback and recurrence in the brain circuits that's not in current computer vision models. Um, 30 milliseconds, by the way, is a lot of time in brain units. And remember, this is only a 200 millisecond duration in which all of the computations are occurring. But 30 milliseconds is enough time to produce um, things like multiple rounds of feedback in the visual system. Another important clue that I would leave you with here is that something I hid from you earlier, but I'll show you now, is that the ability of those deep networks to predict IT neurons is much better at the front part of the response. You can see that on the y-axis here, the ability to predict IT population codes. The deep networks predict great, pretty well at the front part. You can see that as a high bar at the top near the blue line. But if you look even just 30 milliseconds later in time, their ability to predict IT falls off quite dramatically. And um, this is important um, um, because um, these late emerging IT features, as I showed you earlier a minute ago, underlie the brain's solution to these CV unsolved images. So it's not as if I'm asking computer vision systems to predict data just to predict data. These data are where the brain solution is actually emerging. So this is really a challenge for both of our fields to improve models, probably including feedback and recurrence in some way that can uh, explain this and therefore lead to better performance as well. And I want to highlight that it's not just me wanting to give you one bit of information that's saying, go back and build a feedback model. We have high resolution data on many thousands of images that we can compare any model to as it unfolds its decoding over time. And so that's the kind of constraint data that we're using in our lab to build new models that incorporate feedback. And if any of you are interested in those kind of comparisons, please come see me after the talk. So this is my last slide here. I'd like to say that our fields have together achieved a decent predictive models of the neural mechanisms of core object perception. Uh, our fine grain analysis, as I just showed you, suggests that a closer match to anatomy, especially feedback and recurrence, may be needed to make the next model gains. I want to also stress, I've been talking to this audience about model building and comparing with spiking data and physiology, but one of the things that neuroscience does and is now able to do better is to start to intervene in the circuits with new tools like optogenetics to be able to silence individual neurons, specific neural pathways. We are working on tools to silence feedback pathways particularly so that we can test ideas causally about the role of feedback. We um, also, and I didn't have time to talk about this, these models are now driving our ability to say, well, now we know how to maybe inject signals in IT, again, using tools to turn neurons on and off in a spatially, temporally precise way. This is paving the way to what might be called broader machine interface, brain-machine interface, to be able to perhaps restore vision to those who have lost sight by injecting in low-dimensional places like IT rather than high-dimensional places like V1 or earlier areas where current brain-machine interfaces are used. Um, how does the system develop and learn? I mentioned this as a question earlier. Uh, our lab has done work on unsupervised learning. Um, I'm sure this is of interest to many of you. Those data in our lab are currently sitting without a model to explain them. Um, it's something that we hope to make progress on in the next few years. Um, but this is, of course, a next frontier. And development from birth is also a challenging area that, again, we're just starting to work on. So these are key open questions now, very open questions. And I'll just leave you with one of the things that I said is there, there are decoders somewhere that I mentioned, and somehow they're reused for object-related tasks and general cognition, or at least we think they might be. And how are they reused to support those things? Those are questions I, I, we haven't touched on at all here. I haven't told you anything about today, and those are questions that we're working on next. 
Um, I really want to end by thanking these folks. I'm really just an ambassador of the work here. Um, they did all the work. I try to highlight various folks along the way, but really everyone on the slide, including the names on the slide, contributed to almost every little bit of thing that I showed you because it's really a team effort in our group, a combination of modeling and data collection. Um, I'd also like to thank my funding agencies and um, really thank the monkey subjects. You saw them working. Um, uh, that has led to great understanding of not only their brains, but we think our own brains. And so th they deserve thanks for that. I also would like to thank all of you. As I said earlier, I mean this in the deepest way, not just for inviting me to present to your group, which again, I feel is a great honor, but also because the work that you're doing is impacting our field, and I hope that you see some of that, and I hope that I've inspired some of you to find even, uh, even deeper ways to connect to the kind of questions that we're interested in brain and cognitive sciences. So thank you. Wow. I'm sure there are questions on the floor. So if you do, we have time for a few questions. Go ahead, Terry. So for the uh, CV unsolved images, uh, is the time long enough that there's actually saccades going on, or is this entirely just within the, the, the brain side of what's going on? Uh, yes, um, all of those were presented, again, just for 100 millisecond duration. We've also tested at 200, but in uh, either viewing duration, there are no time for saccades to occur there. So this is all still in this briefly glimpsed window. And that, you know, this is a great question, because of course feedback is going to play a role at larger time scales. You're going to make eye movements and so forth. But even at these very narrow time windows, those, there's interesting computations going on, and that's what we've been focused on. So, thank you. Okay, question from Bassett. Hi. Um, my question is regarding um, something called transfer learning, where you take um, a, a model that might have uh, taken weeks or days or weeks to train, um, and you take a model like that and you retrain just the last few layers, um, and you can even do it in like uh, on the order of minutes. Um, my question is, do you think humans do that? Do you think that we're, we, we're passing on large networks through DNA and that um, when, when you're born that you have this model that can do object recognition and then we're doing training as, uh, as we live our lives? Uh, yeah, I try, uh, that's a great question. I tried to uh, 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 say when I said IT is a fixed basis set, I think that connects to your question. So somehow during development you build a ventral stream and we're still not sure how much of that exists at birth versus development. But let's say at the end of development, you have a ventral stream, a powerful representation in IT that is able to then quickly support the learning of a range of tasks, which we've estimated with those linear decoders, as I showed you. So we view those linear decoders as you know, approximates of what an animal might need to do when it's faced with a new labeled example. And so one of the things we're doing now is we're asking animals to quickly learn one task versus another. It takes them about a day to learn a new object. I showed you animals performing with on the order of 24 to 30 objects. It takes about a day to learn a new object. Um, and so um, we think what's happening, in fact, there's a lot of evidence for this, is that the changes in the brain are not in the ventral stream for that learning. They're downstream. So there is some transfer from a kind of relatively fixed basis set, at least fixed at the level of adulthood, to then support those uh, many, many tasks. And that's what I meant by IT being a, f a big uh, feature, uh, a kind of a fixed feature basis to support that. So I hope that connects to your, your question. Uh, hi, uh, I have a uh, follow-up question to the first question. Uh, you mentioned that there's a 30 millisecond gap, which is very interesting because that's basically like three hops, right, three layers. So does, does this give us a search radius to identify what possible regions are influencing IT? Uh, it does a bit. Um, I also, I, I, you know, the, the numbers are hard. Again, that was an average number. I hope you saw that um, many images, even, you know, even CV unsolved images, some were shorter than some of the blue images. So that was an average number. So um, I, I, I don't think you would want to say, oh, we need like an extra subsystem with three layers to do this, right? It's just there's something evolving over time that we're, we're picking up on when we parse the images that way. Um, that being said, it does give you some search radius, and one of the interesting things that we're thinking about, and uh, especially um, um, with other collaborators, is that you think about just deeper, deeper models as approximating what's happening in a, a feedback system. And, um, but uh, I, I don't know if I can say more than that 
right now. Um, but I'm glad that you're thinking about that. Maybe we can talk more after. Okay, thank you. So my, my question would be, how far along is, is neuroscience with modeling the physical side of, of the brain and modeling neurons? Do we see any quantum mechanical effects, things that you know we, we will <laughs> never be able to catch without having dynamic systems in, in, mm -hmm. in our models? Well, of course, as you probably know, there's a lot of effort now in connectomics to try to kind of measure the precise detailed connectivity within a small cortical volume at the synaptic level. Um, quantum effects, I think most people are, are not thinking there's going to be much of relevance there, but that's speculative. Um, what I hope you took from our work is that, look, just by counting spikes, you can explain something that was previously mysterious. I don't need... Um, very crazy quantum effects to ex go from neurons to actual behavior. Um, and so, you know, in t uh, my approach is until you need something more complicated, stick with the simple model for the time being. But there are a lot of efforts to measure the structure of cortex in much finer grains, and those data are coming soon. So the neuroscience is producing a lot of data right now. Some of it will be very relevant to your interests, and some may be less so. And as I said at the beginning, sifting through is going to be a uh, part of the job. So thank you. Hi, uh, very interesting talk. So recently we have seen like a very deep structure uh, neural networks, like hundreds of layers or even thousands of layers. So can you comment on, on the difference between these structures and what human or monkey uses? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, I was sort of hinting at that when I showed that slide that the more recent models, as you say, some of them have gotten much deeper and they're not necessarily fitting the neurons better. In fact, some of them are fitting worse. Um, and, you know, that would be our prediction. At some point, if you just say performance optimize and you don't constrain the architecture at all, at some point the model should deviate from what we're seeing in the brain. And we're seeing some, some hints of that. Um, but that being said, we don't yet know when I say there's four layers in the cort you know, four cortical layers, maybe we should think of each area of the brain as being, you know, f you know, 10 layers within V1 relative to a model. And so this starts to require comparison of each feature layer of a model with each level of the brain. And those are the kind of things that we're doing in the lab now to, to answer those questions. But I share your, maybe it was, maybe I'm imagining it, your skepticism that is if you get very, very deep, you're probably deviating from what the brain is doing, although you might think of that as a recurrent circuit that you're approximating with a deep model. But this is the edge of what, what we know. Um, I, so I, I'm sorry I can't say more than that. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, so you showed the graph uh, where um, monkey's brain is doing better than uh, on some images than the uh, uh, developed deep neural networks. Have you done some analysis, I mean, maybe somebody in your lab, where you found some patterns in these images that makes it harder uh, for neural networks to work, or some summaries or some intuitions why those images are harder, and what's special about those tasks or images? Yes, I, I'm sorry, I may have said that too quickly, but we tried to regress out various factors from those images to find things. and nothing comes out of that. So um, we, don't, we don't yet know what makes them, what, what, what makes those CV unsolved images special. Um, it's a great question, but we've tried and we haven't seen anything yet. Okay, thanks. Hi. Uh, yeah. uh, so you mentioned that uh, you're only using the rate uh, of spiking. Uh, what, are, what is the time window that you are looking at for each of the different layers for uh, the increase in the spiking over the basal rate? So I, I was a little fast and loose in that. In the decoding section, I was using 100 millisecond time windows. But later when I showed you, for instance, the model's ability to fit the neurons as a function of time, almost the last slide I showed, they were using narrower time windows on the order of 10 to 20 milliseconds to count spikes to produce a feature vector. So you kind of have a rolling feature vector in IT, and then you ask how well the model fits in each of those smaller windows. Um, does, so is that answer? Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering about, like, you know, you have certain spi spiking pattern in, say, the V1, and then that spiking pattern leads to V2. So there should be some sort of a time slice, uh, like a typical, like in, in our area, we would take one layer, process the convolution one, feed it into convolution two, and so forth. You know, different layers of the neural network. So is there, like, a 10 millisecond time slice that you're looking at, or 20 millisecond? 
again, we, we don't know the exact time slice to, that's the right slice to look at. Um, the, the best grounding we have on that is with respect to the behavior, right? Because as a, a neuroscientist can look at spikes and say, you know, every spike matters and whatever time window matters, it's a bit arbitrary. So the only way we ground that is by saying, well, look, in IT, what time slice do we need to predict the behavior accurately? And it, it turns out that there's a pretty wide range of time slices that are still able to predict quite well. Um, and we're working on refining that with that finer grain behavioral data. Um, but it's somewhere less than 100, but probably more than 10. But that's for IT to map to behavior. How V1 maps to V2 to V4, that may be a different time scale in which to think about okay, things. Thanks. So uh, these are great questions, but um, I, that's all I can say. Uh, given the time limit, I try to ask uh, one question only and clear and short. This side. Okay. Uh, sorry if you've mentioned this already, but I was wondering how much of this generalizes to the auditory system. Like, how much does AlexNet explain any auditory data if any data like that was collected? That, that's a great question. Thank you. So, um, Josh McDermott's group at MIT and Alex Kell, a graduate student in his lab, along with Dan Yamans, who I showed you, have been comparing deep networks with measurements from fMRI in humans. And there, we know much less about the auditory system than the visual system. Um, but already, those networks are offering some insights as to the number of levels of auditory processing that may be happening in the brain. We're still trying to get the lay of the land in the human auditory system. So they don't usually report things in terms of explained variants, although I would refer you to Alex and Josh to, if, you, if you want to explore that question. They have some very nice work on it, much of it unpublished. And I'm happy to make the connection if you like. But, but I think you can also think about deep networks more broadly, as you just alluded to, to the somatosensory system as well. And this is a line of work that Dan Yamans at, at Stanford is pushing forward at, when he has, in his new professorship there. It's, um, it's just about 6 o'clock on the last day of the conference. So I invite you to speculate a little bit. If you had to speculate what kind of information might be uh, contained in this speculated feedback from IT, what do you imagine it might be? What's your guesses? <laughs> um, oh, that's, uh, <sighs> to me, that question is a little bit like asking what kind of information is in the feed-forward flow, <laughs> right? Which is already, it's just not easily amenable to human words. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think of the recurrence as mostly being a way to put a compact, a deeper network into a smaller space, perhaps, in terms of what I think we're seeing. That's my speculation there. However, I'm not sure that all the feedback lines in the ventral stream are about computation online, or what we'd call inference. They may be there to support learning, or for the maintenance of the circuits for learning. So, um, you know, and that's going to happen over much longer time scales than 30 milliseconds. So, you know, sorting that out, which is which, is going to require tools to say, can we knock down certain cell types and not other cell types to sort of sift through the information? And that's kind of the edge of where our work is to be able to measure that precisely. So my guess is it's a mixture of kind of learning signals and a kind of a deeper network that's kind of folded back to, um, to allow it to kind of maybe fit in a smaller space, if you will. But that's completely speculative, so thank you for allowing me to speculate. Please, the next one on the side. Okay. I think this relates to a previous question. So I think a lot of monkey works you pr present today is about rate coding. And also I think the main logic of deep neural networks is also about the rate of the neurons firing. So, but I think it's also important about when the neuron will fire. So do you think adding temporal coding to the models uh, besides the feedback will like, also improve the similarity between the models and human and monkey brain activities? Yes, this, this is a, a great question. Again, I don't, you know, the field tends to talk about rate codes versus time codes. To me, it's just which time scale is, or is relevant. And this was the earlier question about 10 millisecond slices or 100 millisecond slices. So, of course, the time matters. If we were averaging over a second, 
you know, things wouldn't match up with the behavior. If we average over a millisecond, I don't think it would either. And so the answers are always in the middle. And I would guess the time scales of around 10 milliseconds, again, that's my speculation, are the most kind of useful time scales to think about the processing. But at the course, at the biophysical level, it matters at much finer time scales. So it starts to depend on what level of detail you want to be able to predict in the neurons. Spike by spike, yes, then timing matters. But for the kinds of computations that many of you are interested in, I tend to think 10 milliseconds or above seems to be sufficient to explain the kinds of behaviors that many of us are interested in. And when that will break down as we dig into the feedback circuits, which are then forcing the time scale, I don't know. But we'll start big, 100, and move smaller and smaller until we kind of don't need to. That's our approach. Whereas maybe others might assume that, oh, we got to start at the spikes and build our way up. But uh, that's a very challenging approach in a very complicated system. So I share your interest, but I, my approach is more as I describe. Thank yeah. you. So give the time uh, limit. I would also uh, have two more questions. Therefore, if you have a burning desire to ask your question, you stay in, in the queue. This. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it was extremely interesting. Uh, so you mentioned the. Uh, that feedback might be the uh, like the missing component uh, like during the talk. There's actually a, a paper uh, by Stanford, Samir et al., that was presented at this conference uh, titled Feedback Networks. So I don't know, that might might be somewhat uh, interesting. Well, uh, if, if that person is here, I would love to chat with them. <laughs> so, um. uh, right. uh, my question is, uh, so the network, we've achieved uh, excellent performance for uh, fairly coarse classes uh, in, uh, in CNNs that we have currently, but have you investigated fine-grained classification at all, or uh, we're still somewhat lacking uh, in terms of our performance there? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't quite hear the oh, question. Uh, sorry, have you investigated fine-grained classification uh, in, in with respect to these models and uh, like pretty much when we have like, uh, we might have course classes like maybe like cat or dog, but mm -hmm. maybe different types of cats and different types of dogs and uh, these types of things. So you mean like subordinate level, like one car versus another? That, uh, that yes. Kind of, um, we, have a, we have a bit. So it turns out humans are not very good at subordinate at those very short time windows. So, you know, and when we look, if you decode out of IT, um, you also get similarly low above chance performance at these time windows. So that brings us into a regime where we probably need eye movements and more time to actually ask, to kind of put piece together the uh, human ability. So when you infer that humans are good at this, you know, in these conditions, they're not that good at very narrow subordinate discrimination at those very short time windows. So, um, uh, so I, I think we're not fully engaged on that problem in the way that you're probably imagining it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, last question. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, do you have any insight as to how the mammalian visual, process, uh, visual pathway, how does it achieve convolution? That is, how are weights shared across a field of neurons? Yeah, it's funny. Everybody I, often says, well, convolution networks can't be right because the brain doesn't do that. And then you open a textbook and there's an assumption that there's a Gabor filter in one part of the visual field and there's going to be a similar Gabor filter at another part of the visual field. I think the field is, can, some people are confused about, you know, that's a convolutional operator in effect. What you're asking is, like, how did it become that way, right? So the way they differ from current convolutional nets is convolutional net, of course, learns the filter type and then just convolves it. Whereas the brain is kind of learning those filters in parallel in effect, right? So I don't think there's actual weight transmission. It's just the learning rules are such that you end up, you know, the statistics are similar enough that you can learn about the world in two different places and end up with a similar set of filters. And I, I think that's a generally shared view of how to think about these networks. Now, some of that might also be in the genetics or the development, but at least the learning statistics also might support that. So I don't think there's weight sharing in the brain, but there is convolution in effect when you execute the, on the image, if you will, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah. Does that 